uh, today's roundtable would be moderated by Dr. Fred Sander. Fred Sander is an old friend, a member of this institute, and who has been involved a great deal in teaching, on teaching both here and at uh, various universities, Cornell and not Sinai, also Sinai. Yeah. Uh, he is a psychoanalyst, but also specializes in family therapy, and some of his books are up front there, and apparently one of his books can be accessed for free on the web. <laughs> so that's it, Fred. Thank you, Ed. I'll check to see if this is working. What? It's not working. Uh, I'll try to speak louder until it works. Um, uh, I'm uh, really delighted to have an opportunity to participate in the Helix program. Um, I have on um, a number of occasions said to Ed, you know, we're having these very interesting meetings. And, uh, how come we never have a psychoanalyst as part of a round table? <laughs> so I think this is his way of uh, either getting back at me or, or taking me seriously, that psychoanalysts in this building might have something to say about the subjects that we cover here, including the subject of love. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I did want to make a few opening remarks. I, I, what is especially exciting today is that the wide number of disciplines, the wide number of disciplines that are represented here, besides psychoanalysis, we have a, um, we have a poet, and we have a curator of the European collection of the Metropolitan Museum. I'll, I'll let them each introduce themselves when, after I say these opening remarks, and we have a neuroscientist, which is the latest. Uh, uh, angle on, on love. I don't think 10 years ago there would have been a neuroscientist yet on the, I may have the time wrong. Um, your, your research is, I think, about five years ago that, that it's published. Uh, they, well, whatever. It's a new field. It's a new field. Love in the mind. The question that we might raise in this discussion is, uh, is love in the heart or is it in the brain? Uh, or some other organ that we don't know about. <laughs> so, uh, and when I first learned the, that I would be doing this moderating, it, it just happened that that day in the New York Times, there was a, a obituary about a man named Mr. Pugash. And I must say, I do remember the name from when he first was not not notarized so, so uh, blatantly uh, in the news when he he threw some, he had some lie thrown into the eyes of his beloved. And, um, and he went to jail for that, maybe 10 years or so. He gets out of jail, and the next thing we know is he marries the woman whom he'd virtually blinded. And so I thought, my goodness, love goes in all kinds of ways. I trust it's not the form of love we're gonna spend too much time on today, but it's true that love takes many, many, many forms and shapes and uh, there's probably no limit to how far love can go. Um, and uh, we'll see some of that one in our discussion. I, I went over to the, e, uh, to the internet and I checked the subject of love and there were a number of categories of love. One is, was called quotes on love and there were 16,000 quotes on love. I didn't go through them all. But I thought two weeks later when we were going to have this meeting, I looked it up again and there were 16,500. <laughs> so so in, just in the two weeks that uh, I was checking the number of wherever these, these quotes are coming from, they just keep arriving and adding to the information explosion. Um, now, I was concerned in this uh, discussion today that the topic is so, uh, you know, something everybody has some strong feelings about, and the field is already the 16,000 quotes tells you already how 
how far and wide the, the subject goes. And I was hoping that in this discussion, we would have some degree of focusing on the subject of love so that we're not completely all over the place, even though the discussion and conversation we have will take us not far afield, but hopefully there'll be overlap and uh, uh, among the five of us. And will there'll be time for discussion at the end uh, there's a possibility we might have one or two questions in, in, before the end so that you have a chance to be heard. Um, I, uh, so I'll just start uh, with Steve Klein to introduce yourself and uh, to tell us about the, a little bit about the heart and poetry. Uh, well, 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 uh, my, Michael. <laughs> I still love you. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> And I don't know if, if, if love is the heart of poetry. I think that um, I think it's an it's the way that that one might access love. But I think that poetry goes in a lot. I mean, the, the wonderful thing about if you take on poetry as a vocation is that you get to address a lot of um, you know a lot of different kinds of things. Um, but I think that it's it, it's it's certainly not out of fear that one writes poetry. Um, which I think is, I'm, I'm haunted by this sort of definition I heard many, many years ago by Emmett Fox, which said, which talks about if you're not feeling love, you're feeling fear, and that basically we, we, in one way or another, we're feeling one of those emotions all the time. So I always think of poetry as the way to, to keep the aperture open toward the love direction and not, it, it, it's a place to let everything happen and not a place to... To, it's not a place for self-censorship. And I think any place that is not about self-censorship is about love. Uh, Fred wanted you to say a word or two about yourself. Oh, I'm Michael Klein. I'm a poet and a writer. I teach writing in the graduate program at Goddard College in Vermont. I've written three books of poems. Um, I wrote a book of essays called The End of Being Known, which is about sex and friendship. And I wrote a memoir called Track Conditions, which is about my experience grooming a Kentucky Derby horse in 1984, who died, and I was blamed for his death. So I write about a lot of things. And um, I, I have a third book of poems that just came out in January called The Talking Day. Um, I'm Andrea Bayer. I'm the curator of uh, Italian Renaissance paintings at the Metropolitan Museum. And I'm here. Uh, because of uh, because I was the curator of this exhibition, Art and Love in Renaissance Italy. Um, and actually, I did think of an anecdote that I wanted to begin this discussion with, because um, the point of this exhibition was to bring together as wide a variety of objects and paintings that had been made during the Renaissance that uh, celebrated those great ritual moments in people's lives, betrothal, marriage, the beginning of a family. And in fact, we wanted to call the exhibition something about marriage, marriage and the family, et cetera. And the powers that be at the Met made us do a survey. And they found out that the word marriage was such a turnoff <laughs> that they would not allow us to proceed with that in our title. And so they encouraged us instead to use the word love. And my colleagues, some of whom were much more academic than I am, were appalled by this because there was so little love in Renaissance, in Renaissance marriage arrangements that um, they felt that we were in some ways distorting the, distorting the conversation. However, I ended up seriously disagreeing with that point of view, and I was very happy that love was in the title. And if I have another two minutes, I'll just tell you a great Renaissance anecdote. You can probably all bring to mind the beautiful Titian Venus of Urbino in the Uffizi. That painting was done for the Duke Guidobaldo della Rovere in 1538, and he wrote a very famous letter to Titian in which he says, don't sell that nude lady to anyone else. Um, and that's the way he describes it. Um, but to me, the thing that was so touching and interesting about that story, Guidobaldo della Rovere at that moment is married for in a dynastic marriage with someone he had had no interest in, and in fact, who was prepubescent when they got married. But he had been in love 
deeply in love the year before he was forced to marry that lady. And I just wanted to read to you his letter to his father briefly, briefly. For two years now I have spoken at length begging you that in giving me a wife it would seem that in this act the principal matter is to satisfy me, given that I carried and still carry such a love for the Lady Clarice, this is Clarice Orsini, due to her qualities and her manners. To let me have her would give me such extreme happiness, and not to have her would cause me such infinite sadness. So I beg you with all my heart, if you have any regard for my sanity and health, sad Satisfy and concede me this favor, knowing that in her is my all. Well, her, his father said no, her mother said no, he was married the next year to an 11 year old, and then bought the Venus of Urbino to put in his nuptial chamber. So, love is a complicated story in the Renaissance, too. <laughs> but uh, Andrea, Andrea was modest in not telling us that the show she curated. Uh, can be found on the web if we're giving a lecture on it. Just looking up the, the title, uh, Love and Art in Renaissance Italy, and you'll be, have a chance to hear her entire lecture on the show, mm -hmm. which is now five, perhaps five yeah. years old. Yeah. Lucy. <laughs> for about 40 years at Einstein College of Medicine. Most, my most recent work has been human brain mapping of early stage, intense mapping. So you have to understand that as a scientist, I really had to focus in on a particular kind of love. There's, you know, there's there's passionate love, there's companionate love, there's love that can develop after, after arranged marriages, uh, there's parental love. We chose to look at early stage intense romantic love. First of all, we didn't know we were going to see any effects in the brain with this new methodology we had, functional MRI. Um, did you see anything? Uh, but we knew that romance, that early stage romantic love, the kind of romance that um, Andrea just read about, can affect people's lives tremendously, affect their behavior tremendously. After all, um, Edward the, the Seventh stepped down from the throne of England in order to marry Wallace Simpson. So romance can affect our lives just tremendously. And it's a, a big force even though some people, it can be a big disruptive force, especially in the Renaissance, <laughs> and especially in Asian societies, they don't trust it because it can be so disruptive. But bottom line is, uh, I'm a neuroscientist studying first romance, that intense feeling, because part of the reason I did that first, because I was pretty sure I could measure something in the brain with this kind of methodology we have. Also, because I knew it affected life so drastically. Really, when you think about it, uh, it, it changes us. Marriage, uh, it's the way we pass on our genes. So much of our life actually revolves around falling in love. And I also have an eye, the eye of the anthropologist, too. One of my collaborators is Helen Fisher, an anthropologist. And the idea that romance uh, is a developed form of a mammalian behavior to pursue preferred mates, that, that romance isn't just a human thing. Anyway, so I'll stop there. <laughs> I don't think you need it. I think that one wasn't fun. Yeah. Testing, testing. Yep. Yeah, you're good. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Dan Slater. Uh, I am a writer and a reporter. Um, and uh, I yeah, are we okay? Um, so it's sort of a funny story about why I'm here. I, I was uh, I was a lawyer before I became a writer, and I was the, uh, the legal affairs reporter at the Wall Street Journal up until about four years ago when I was laid off. And uh, 
I, uh, you know, the layoff happened to coincide with the end of a relationship, so it was a lot to handle at one time, and I was seeing a therapist, and uh, she said to me, well, some of my patients have had luck with online dating, so we should give that a shot. And after several sessions, I finally, you know, I took her advice, and I got on to Match.com, and I started doing online dating, and that, you know, began to become a focus of the sessions. Uh, and she was asking me, oh, well, you know, what are the sites? And almost like she was using the sessions to get information out of me to pass on to her, <laughs> to her patients uh, because she'd get asked about online dating. And, and, and she said to me, uh, she said, well, maybe one day you will write a book about this. And uh, as I was saying downstairs, uh, I, I said there was no way I would write a book about this. Um, but um, after a few more things happened, uh, one of which was finding out that my mom and dad met through a computer dating service in 1965, uh, I, I started to get serious as a uh, researcher and a journalist uh, looking into uh, the online dating business and how it was affecting modern relationships. So. Uh, the product was out as a book uh, uh, that I published last month. It's called Love in the Time of Algorithms. Uh, it was excerpted in the Atlantic magazine um, this last month. Uh, and um, so I've been out speaking about the book. Um, so I come at this, I guess, from a slightly different angle. Um, there's a lot of psychology in the book. Uh, there's a lot of business reporting. There's a lot of narrative. Um, but really, it's a book about how this technology has come to mediate um, the way that we meet and discover mates now. And so uh, that's the reason I'm here. <laughs> Can I add to that? <laughs> I met my you boyfriend. You don't need permission. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's an interesting story because I, I met my boyfriend online. Uh -huh. And we've been together for 10 years. And what's interesting is that can, when can I first I met. The site? Can I ask the site? What was the, what was the, the website? The, yeah, it, it was, was called, it was part of Lava Light or Lava. It was a Bubs Lava, for yeah. Men. It was, I mean, for gay men. It was for a man line. I can't remember. And there was a sex part and there was a relationship part. And I put my profile on all of them because I didn't really know. Because you what, don't know. What, what, I didn't know that you could actually have, a, that you could actually be looking for a relationship that didn't necessarily have to do with all of those things. I had been out of a relationship for 15 years. And the only reason I went online was because I was convinced by an ex-student that, you know, I, I had been off it for a year and she said, try it again, you might just get paid dirt. And I did, the next day I met this guy. Okay, so what happened was that we were going back and forth for about three months and I, and I sat down with Marie Howe, who I'm actually here replacing today, and she said, you have to meet him immediately. I said, why? And she said, because you're angelizing. And you're making it, you're making somebody up. Even though they are, for all intents and purposes, proving them their existence by these amazing emails. I mean, we, yeah. I really fell in love with right, we both writers, and that was really how it was happening. And it, what was interesting is, sure enough, as soon as we met, it actually, I, we, I had to force it to work in this very strange way. I was gonna give, I had to give it a chance because I knew that I was up against my imagination. And when it was physically presented to me, it was like, he looked nothing like I thought he would look. We actually didn't even exchange pictures because of that, because I didn't think it mattered. It matters, you know, matters a lot. So I just say it's it's such a and to to be you know to be, to still be there after ten years. I have to say it's a different kind of work. And I th and in this day and age, I think that we've become. I, it's interesting. I think we've become people who are willing to do the kind of work that we would never. My parents would never have done. That. I mean, when you told me your, when you said your parents met, I, I and mean, that's like who does that? Like twenty years yeah. ago. I mean, it was a very different way of courting. And I'm not. And what's also fascinating saying is how do we, and this might be a question to, to I mean, how do we acclimate to the, to, the, to, to um, using different phenomenology around instinct? Which, the, the, which meeting somebody online is not, you know, it's, it, it's very different than, than having an instinct for somebody that you've met at a sure. party, mm -hmm. for instance. So, so I think, you know, one of, one of the ways that online dating makes a difference is that you are sort of meeting, uh, you know, like an avatar of a person before you're meeting yeah. the person themselves. And, and, and one of the many results of that is that you invent an idea in your head of what, you know, he or she is like. Um, and then, of course, at some point you have to actually go meet them and you have to sort of, um, you know, align those two things. Right. And for some people that can create a lot of disappointment. 
because if the fantasy becomes very intense, then you ultimately have to reconcile the person with the fantasy, and, and that can be a disappointing process. Um, but I think that's part of a learning curve thing. I think the people who do online dating for a while, they learn, hopefully, to get past that. Um, you know, I was saying to Lucy before we started that, that I think one of the great things that online dating is doing is that it is presenting people with some opportunities to fail. Um, at least they're getting out there and meeting people and having relationships and having failed relationships and hopefully learning from them and hopefully making a better selection down the road um, as a result. So I don't know if I've answered anything that you No, but it's interesting. Presented, what they, but, but then again, what is the authentic self that meets the avatar? Who is well, the Well, forget the avatar. The avatar okay. is just a way of meeting. Okay. The avatar, me I mean, you know, um, unless for you, Romance, love, and companionship means sitting in a room and imagining people, which I think for 99 to 100% yeah, of really. people, that's not the case. Right. Ultimately, it's about meeting someone. Right. So, so the way I think of it is that, uh, in a way, the technology is just a discovery tool. And you know, I think the goal for most people should be to get offline as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it, no, you're not spotting them across the room, or you're not spotting them in a class, or on the subway, or in a bar, or whatever. I think for some people that feels very strange because we, you know, become so used to that way of meeting. But it's really it's just a discovery tool, and and so I don't think the profile matters as much. I think the profile is one of those things about online dating that, that is sort of a superficial difference. Mm -hmm. It's a fun thing to focus on because it can be funny um, and it can be the source of, uh, of, of, of sort of a lot of fibbing yeah. about yourself. But, but ultimately, you're going to put that aside and you've got to go out. And I think it's interesting that if you, way, way before any of this could have taken place, one of the things that uh, both of you are describing as sort of the idealization that you idealize yourself and you idealize the person with whom you're communicating on with eyeline dating until you can no longer do that because you're confronted with the actual person and have to relate to them. But this actually, on a completely different scale, is of course the basis of much of Renaissance ideas about love and, and embedded in poetry and so on, that in fact it's best not to meet that ideal love and many of the poets never did meet that ideal love. Sure. They saw them in church and invented an entire thing about who they were and how great they, um, and how they uh, epitomized all of these ideals. But when they met them, it would be a completely different thing and in, in fact, when they met them, they usually were very happy that they that those great ideals were married to someone completely right. different, and they didn't have to deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis. But it is, it, it, in a, in a way, it's the same kind of thing that you overlay on somebody. So it seems mm -hmm. to me uh, what you said that you study romantic love, uh, but from what I hear, first there seems to be the issue of interest. Mm. that whether it's on the internet or in person or whatever, there has to be interest. Then there is a term you didn't use, and I wonder why you chose not to use it, which is infatuation. Oh, so... And then you came to romantic love, which different people have different definitions of. So I thought maybe... It... So for my definition, I like comes from Elaine Hatfield for romantic love, and it's the intense desire for emotional union with another person. Unity, did you say? Emotional mm -hmm. union. Union. With another person. That intense desire for emotional union. That's, that is how romance can begin. And certainly, what I'm talking about, some you could use the word infatuation. It can start out that way, where one of the things that we asked people who we were interviewing to become subjects in the experiment, the most important question was, what percentage of the day do you think about mm. this person? Right? Mm. Now, most of the people who were part of this study said, are you kidding? I can't stop thinking about them. You know, that, uh, they're, I can't sleep. You know, they're, they're totally obsessed with the other person. That doesn't last all that long, usually. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't not sleep. Um, people who are 
in love in the early stages often lose weight. That's one of the, that's one of the symptoms too for, for being in love. Uh, you have to, it has to moderate a little bit and a little bit of attachment sets in uh, because you have to go to work and do other things and, and, and build a home actually. Uh, so this intensity you, you can call uh, infatuation, I guess. But it, it, what's interesting to me, one of the interesting things we found, I'll, I'll just tell you, is that for people in that stage, when they looked at a picture of their beloved, their sweetheart, their romantic partner, I thought you know, maybe it would activate parts of the brain that have to do mainly with cognition, you know, recognizing something attractive about the other person. So remember, they've already fallen in love with the person. What was fantastic was the area of the brain that was active was deep in kind of a reflex level part of the brain. It's called the brain stem. It's a reward system that neuroscientists had identified. But at a very primitive level of the brain, I'm totally, at, I'll, dare I say, the unconscious level, but you know, um, I'll say nonverbal level, maybe. Anyway, uh, a part of the brain that is not just human at all, part of the brain we share with other mammals. And uh, it's this primitive system. It's shared with our, our sense that uh, water tastes good when we're thirsty. You know, it's, it's like thirst. And if you remember being in love, um, as a matter of fact, poetry, I think, can, mm -hmm. uses the word thirst, even I, I hunger after my beloved, or I'm thirsty for you. You know, that kind of, that is a, poetry and literature often describes very well the, what the kind of findings that, that we saw in the brain as we look back. But there was, so, what we say is that it activated part of the reward system that mediates basic drives like hunger and thirst. But right next to that area, actually, is another area that we found was activated just by the attractiveness of the face. You know, so you can, you can maybe sit down at a coffee shop with someone, see them the first time, and, and you have a reaction to them, and there's a, they, you know the face is attractive in a general sense. There's a beauty that, that we all see in art, you know, there's a... Um, and psychologists call this the difference wanting and liking. So you can want someone, right? And that can be, goodness knows, that the face has to be somewhat attractive to you, but there are other things, and maybe it does have to do with your experiences with a primary caregiver and there's something about that person that reminds you of them. But you focus on that person, you want that person versus liking them to start with. And, maybe, and liking can turn into wanting, actually. But that the brain studies identified very nicely these two different systems is interesting to me. I'd be very interested to know how much of that liking side is inherent to one person or is really conditioned by cultural norms. Um, so that, uh, to, again, to come back to the kind of descriptions of beauty in the Renaissance, the same kind of beauty is described over and over again. So you can imagine that First of all, people tried to look like that by you know, plucking their hair and dyeing it blonde and plucking their eyebrows and so on. Women tried to resemble that. Um, but men seemed, in poetry at least, to respond mostly to that. And are they responding to something that's inherent to themselves or have they somehow been trained over time to like a certain kind of face, a certain kind of body? What mm -hmm. responses that we to that? To like ourselves, and so yeah. what we we like to. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are at the psychoanalytic institute here, so we can talk a little bit. About is, that a cue, is that a cue for me to say so? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I found when you know I, I interviewed over 100 online daters um, 
for the, uh, you know, for this. And, and uh, um, one of the things that I would hear over and over again would be, the, you know, the tales of sort of, you know, as we were saying earlier, the ideal and of a, sort of inventing the ideal early on. And, um, and then having to kind of reconcile the reality with the ideal, but certainly at the beginning of love, when you're feeling an intense romantic love, one, at least in my own experiences and the experiences of a lot of people I interviewed for the book, was that you know, you'd meet someone who you liked, and part of that intensity was you know, sort of inventing an ideal. Oh my God, this person's amazing. This is the, the, the they, you know, they do this and that, and she's funny and, and, and all this. And then over time, of course, that starts to dissipate. And then you say, well, you know what? She actually, she leaves a lot of dishes in the sink. <laughs> and uh, gosh, you know, I really wish that she would take her shoes off in the house when she comes in out of the, you know, whatever your thing is, whatever your little, and, and so the ideal, starts to, the ideal no longer exists. The ideal is kind of shattered. And, and, and I think that with online dating, one of the things online dating allows you to do is, is become addicted to that ideal over and over again, because just because you can meet more people, it's got to, you know, I want to feel that again. I want to feel that infatuation. So I met a lot of people who would kind of, you know, the serial online dater, the person who always was looking for that kind of next early fix. You know, I don't, first of all, I don't think there is an ideal. I think that's the problem to begin with. And I've fallen in love with people that I'm not supposed to fall in love with by, in terms of what I think I like or I desire. And much of it has to do with desire. I also think that if it's real love, there has to be a spiritual element to it. In other words, one of the best, believe it or not, the best definition I've ever heard for this is by Scott Peck, who's not my favorite writer. But he said this great thing that love was being engaged in the spiritual progress of somebody else without insisting that they satisfy you. And I think, in, and, I, and that definition, it seems to me, can be carried over in a, in a wide array of many different things that happen in life. It could be physical or emotional or spirit. I mean, I think that, that covers a lot of ground. Even sexually, I think it can cover ground. But sat, the idea of getting something back in a relation, in a love relationship, I think is where it gets screwy. <laughs> I really do. I mean, and particularly when you have love for something that is not a person. I mean, I love many, many things in the world that have nothing. And the other thing I was thinking of is I got a letter from a wonderful writer named William Maxwell. You were talking about animals. I mean, I, there, there's nothing greater on this planet than that love. I mean, can we all agree right there? I mean, that this should be an animal planet, and we should be the guardians of the animals. <laughs> I really believe that. And there's this wonderful letter from William Maxwell who said that um, he, he, I, he read my book, and he, it was, we were going back and forth and about horses, and he had this horse story that he wanted to tell me, and he said, when I was 17, I fell in love with a mare named Diana, and because this is a true love story, never saw her again. <laughs> well, uh, I... I I, I just wanted to, uh, I, I noticed that I've been relatively quiet as a moderator, and there are a number of reasons for that. One is that I was aware that if I didn't say anything, a little bit like an analyst uh, in the quiet <laughs> phase, uh, the, the conversation seemed to be moving in the direction of uh, sort of, I think, deeper issues and themes that involve the human being. And, and uh, I, I thought, well, I could let this go on and be, before long we'll have, the id will be on the table. Uh, but uh, I, I do want to, uh, first of all, say that, Lucy, when you said, you know, you apologize for using the word unconscious, uh, you, you don't have to apologize for, for bringing the unconscious into, into our conversation. The, the uh, aspect of falling in love and being in love and relating in general has, uh, to my way of seeing it, always involves images that people have of the other. And they either want to find that image out there somewhere, or if they don't find it, uh, they will try to create that image, some image they have within themselves of what would, they would feel most comfortable with. And then they will try to induce the image of the other in, in images that they have of that person. And of course, it gets further complicated by the other person similarly has, has images. And that's where my profession comes in because when I, as a couples therapist, almost always the problem, presenting problem is the image that people have of one another doesn't fit uh, the person who they're with. And that seems to me the human condition. There's no 
there's nobody who's going to be a, a symbiotic twin uh, or be exactly the way you want them to be or to be the same as you. And so I did, did want to bring that up as a... So Fred, how, a, how do you avoid that trap? <laughs> Which yeah, trap? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, for your twin. Someone, uh, um, well, there are a number of ways to do that. Uh, in, in, in the therapeutic world, there are two ways that that can happen. When in, in the traditional psychoanalytic framework, uh, a patient comes in and begins to trans transfer feelings onto the analyst that are totally sort of in their head. And the, and the analyst then tries to interpret what, what, are, what image are they trying to create in the, in the analyst, is it some version of, the, of a sibling or a parent, a father or a mother? And by gaining some insight into that, they can say, well, this is something I have to keep, keep my eye on, that I don't fall into that trap that you sort of suggest that we all fall into. Now, when I see a couple, I, in some ways it's somewhat easier to me because each party is projecting onto the other person some irrational uh, parts of themselves, and one can do two uh, for the price of one, so to speak. The transferences are going on both ways, and so you can uh, you can then uh, begin to examine that and help them also get greater insight into uh, who they are, what what they're about, and who they want to be. Before, when you were telling me about your analyst, said to you, uh, you know, there's a book in there. I thought to myself, my analyst never told me there was a book that made me, you know, no, I didn't have an analyst who's, who, who told me that I was going to, I wrote a book anyway, but, but I, I wasn't told that I had a book that might come out. Now that's, that's, a, that's a different intervention that, uh, that your analyst Career said. Career coach. Huh? <laughs> yeah, coach. So, but it, this goes on in the analytic and in the therapeutic room as well. That is, there are transferences and counter-transferences between the patient and their therapist. And hopefully the therapist is not overly uh, filling the room with his or her transferences. But anyway, I was just you know, struck by how almost everything we say ultimately brings up our own way of being in the world. Uh, uh, not Stephen, but... Uh, Michael. Michael. <laughs> Uh, Who's Steven? Steven? Steven is my son. Ah, <laughs> I knew it was somebody. So, I knew it was somebody. <laughs> Lots of transferences going on here. <laughs> well, you asked me. I told you. I'm glad I asked. So, my, uh, so Michael, uh, you, 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 had a lot, you had a lot of affect when you, when, when you were talking. That comes from who you are and how you, what you think mm -hmm. is a normal or, or regular way of being in the world. It's not the same as the other people in the room. It's, it's your... It's your it's who you are. Right. So uh, that's what I think psychoanalysis has to offer people. That is to examine themselves at the same time that they are examining the world and who they're with and what they're doing. And it's, it's on the process that ground. Of self -examination. I think it's on that ground when people are most themselves that you fall in love. Well, but oh, you know, what I am having a problem with is that uh, everybody's talking about something else. I'm not so sure you're all talking about love. To begin with, I'm not understanding from your definitions what is love. He's talking about dating and thoughts you have about the person before you have met them. You are talking about meeting the person and maybe losing all those thoughts that you had or not losing. You are talking and saying it was a good thing that some of these people, in fact, didn't meet the women because if they had met, it wouldn't have worked out and would have been bad. And uh, when you talk about it, you talk about reward centers and that is present in animals. And, and so I'm not so sure. And you talk about varieties of love. You mentioned a number of them. So what, what is it you people think love is? Is it sex? Is it love? Is it uh, love and sex? Is no sex at all? What is it? Well, that was, uh, that was, uh, that was, I really say, and I'm not being simplistic, I really, I did say what it was. I think a number of things. It's the opposite of fear, and it's not, it, it's not demanding that somebody satisfy you if you are in a relationship. I think uh, those two things. It can't so, be uh, the uh, opposite uh, because there are a lot of people who are uh, full of anxiety but also think they are in love or love. But so, they're not. So anxiety, anxiety. <laughs> so, they're 
doing something else. You so, have a sense of, you have a certain sense of certainty. I, well, I, 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 I don't agree. Not, as much as I can be. I, first, I have to jump in. Jump! Because Dive. I, I, I want to comment on what you said, and, and you can't imagine how, kind of, from the brain studies, how true some of the things you've said may be. And, at the, in the next round table, you're going to be talking about fear, and you'll have Joe Ledoux here. He was the one who really discovered the amygdala uh, plays a big role in fear. Now, there's another thing that happens in the brain when people look at their beloved, at their romantic partner. There's one area of the brain where activity goes down tremendously in everybody, and it's in the amygdala. What? It's in the amygdala which we know plays a big role in mediating our feelings of fear. Now, anxiety too, but anxiety can be, is, is different, right? And you can certainly be, you can have all these emotions around love of anxiety and, and, and you can be sad, uh, you can be euphoric, you can have lots of emotions around love. My idea is that love is best described as a drive a drive toward another person. And, and with that comes, let me tell you some interesting data we, we just got. Uh, we did a study of people, it, they happened to be in China. Uh, they were in love. We scanned them four years ago. So they were deeply in love. And we called them four years later to say, are you still with that person? <laughs> And we weren't sure that anything would predict. You know, we were looking for predictions. So would there be a difference between those who were still together compared to those who had broken up? One of the, there turned out to be a difference. I was stunned, I was real. <laughs> but it's so consistent with some psychology because one of the things was parts of the brain that are associated with negative judgment showed a decrease in activity. It's one thing that's interesting. But the other thing that addresses what you said is that uh, there was a decrease in activity of parts of the brain, and I have to summarize a lot of stuff, that have to do with our sense of self. And what it looked like people were doing was actually First of all, not judging the other person negatively, but secondly, also in some way suppressing their sense of self. And uh, it does, indeed, the psychologists know a lot about this. They call, they call it incorporation of other in the self. A lot of people who study romance and relationships, and there's even a scale for incorporation of other in the self. You know? And uh, that ability to incorporate someone, you're incorporating someone in your sense of self. Some people think that romance is actually a very fast expansion of the self. Mm. Self-expansion. That's a great thought. My, my colleague, Art Aaron, who's a psychologist who studied love all of his career, his um, email address is at selfexpansion.com. <laughs> <laughs> But so it's a rapid expansion of the self, but also perhaps the ability to indeed put your needs kind of last even, the other person first. And, and by the way, I just have to say one other thing because you, you mentioned animals. And I grew up on a farm with horses actually and love dogs and, and, and animals. And, um, one of the things that I actually did for myself was to scan myself to when looking at my beloved dog. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, but so what was the result was of that? <laughs> it was different. It was different from looking at my newlywed husband. You know. <laughs> what way? Uh, this this ventral tegmental area that is in the brain stem, that is this area of the brain we share with other animals, <laughs> um, was not activated, although I would have, I was surprised. So what does that say about what that so part of So it's not the... the same drive, and it's not the same complexity, because the dog accepts anything. <laughs> Perhaps well, also I know that my 
my, myself and, and my survival is not dependent on her. Whereas for, for my husband, I now, after doing these studies for 10 years or more, I com have come to see romantic love and attachment as part of our survival systems. We take them for granted. Now, also, um, I've studied the motor system in neurology. We take standing up against gravity for granted. We take love and attachment for granted, but they are actually essential for our survival, yeah, is my way of looking a, at a, it now. That's a big illusion. Uh, it's a big illusion to uh, take it for granted that the love is there and it's unconditional. Yeah. Uh, you, in your own research, uh, I think you also look at people who fall out of love. Yes. And, and, and what's the, and what's the uh, other side of falling in love that is falling out of the love? The cruelty Why, why of do love. people fall out of love? Well, uh, I mean, the other night I watched um, the uh, Metropolitan's version of uh, Othello. Some of you may yes. have watched yeah. it. And, uh, you know, Jealousy. here you're watching a man who's, who's so unbelievably in love with Desdemona. And shortly within, you know, just a short period of time, Iago has him questioning that love. And before you know it, he hates his wife <laughs> and is about, and he proceeds to, to murder her. Mm -hmm. So I think we can't have this discussion without looking at the dialectic of love yes. and non-love, uh, love and hate. Well, Peter I, I'd like to, that picture. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd, I'd like to jump in there, too. First of all, I don't want to be held accountable for what my Renaissance people thought about each other. That's not my own personal <laughs> feelings about love. I prefer to meet the people that I, that I idealize. But, but it's very important, actually, in the whole Renaissance system, the, the, the the cruelty of love, the opposite side of it. And so, in fact, if they had been um, confronted with your evidence, um, I think that for most people in the Renaissance, they would say, that proves that our system is the best. Because what we are looking for, to, what we're looking for to build is, a, um, is a, a system of life that guarantees the survival of the people in it, and that gives them that kind of trust and faith in the next day that they did not find an extreme romantic love. What they found was an attachment. That attachment led to that kind of, right. a, a, to a, a solid base for love, for ongoing love, and for family. And what they feared the most was the cruelty of love, the betrayal, the loss, which of course for women was catastrophe that if you could not put your faith in, in the actual family building side of, of love. So they, when they would have looked at the picture of their loved one, you know, they would have wanted that to be someone who was going to be there the next year, the next year, the next year. Um, and then that would have been something that would have led them to a, a satisfaction in life and, and to an avoidance of fear. You know, we put a lot of faith in, in romantic love and the hope that it will continue, or so it seems to me. I'd like mm -hmm. to bring up another play, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Sylvia the Goat is a play that, uh, that Edward Albee wrote, and in which uh, a, uh, a man falls in love with a goat. And uh, mm -hmm. during the course of the play, someone asked him, well, 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 why did you fall in love with a goat? How could that be? He said, it was a look in the goat's eyes. Yeah. Somehow there, were right. the, there the was chemistry. some kind of eye contact that was made. And at least that's, the, that's what Albie gives as the, the modus of falling in love. That there's something about the eye contact, which of course as an analyst I'm listening to this and thinking, aha, uh, what I haven't said yet in this, in this uh, symposium is that the symposium is that Falling in love, as Freud said, is, ref is refinding a love object. That is, one, one infantile, infantile experiences dictate largely what happens later in people's lives. They may not want to believe that, but uh, the infantile sexuality has its way of finding itself in the adults, in the adult world, whether it's on the on the uh, internet or whether it's, uh, it's uh, letter writing between between people. Actually, we're talking about our, how our parents met. My, my parents met 
by a, a, my mother's brother putting an ad in the paper in, uh, you know, in 1910 or something so that like was, that. that was an early form of online dating? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was just the yeah. media, there was and, a media. And, you know, of course, that, here's where so, so sociology and, and anthropology come in, where we alluded to our cultures play a role in all of these questions as well. We, we're going to have an anthropologist here this afternoon as well. There are a number of other disciplines. We're, we don't have the whole field to ourselves. Anthropologists have a lot to say about what happens at any particular period of time, like in the Renaissance when arranged marriages outnumbered marriages mm -hmm. by choice. So uh, there's no one kind of theory that's going to explain everything. There's going to be a, a, a series of different factors that make for what happens at any particular time in uh, our own history. Can I say something about Albie for just a minute? Albie. He writes the most unlovable creatures on the American stage. I mean, it, and it was interesting that you brought up that particular play, which I actually think is his best play. But look at his work. He doesn't. He knows nothing about romantic love, mm -hmm. really. It's what he's about. That's what his plays are about. It's about the cruelty of love. Well, he's not. Maybe he would say that's not what he's writing about. He would say many things. I, I did an interview with Edward Albee, and it, I, I, I felt like I was interviewing an imposter, to be honest with you. I well, never felt like I was getting the truth. Well, to tell you, to give you an example of how I think there was some truth in that play. Uh, as the play moves on, you learn that uh, George, when he was a teenager, was in an auto accident in which he ran over his parents and killed them. And, uh, You're talking about uh, Virginia Woolf. What? You're talking about who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. Yeah, who's right? afraid yeah. of Virginia Woolf. And, and then Martha, we learned that Martha, when she was a young girl, her mother died, father remarried, and her, stepfa her stepmother also died. Mm -hmm. So here you have two people who had loss of their one parent or, or two parents in their early years. So what do they end up doing? They end up hooking up with each other for a lot of other reasons, and they don't have a child mm -hmm. except for the one that they make believe. Mm -hmm. So here they are, because it's dangerous to have a child. A child will kill you sooner or later. So I mean, I don't think that there's no truth the in that play. Is, did they love each other? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think, uh, I, I, you know, I, I knew when we were going to meet that there was going to be no agreement about what love means. What, what, love what, means uh, never to have it to say you're sorry. I, I think it's the, one of the most misused words in the English language. And, and I was hoping that one of the things that would come out of this symposium is that we, we, we give this word up. It's not a word that means very much, no. except to the, what we want it to mean and how we imagine it. But what about love of the world? I disagree. I'll just have to go on the record. And say. Yeah, you disagree with what? Yeah, because she, that's what you said. No, this is what you're actually studying. Romance and love is something very specific. I think we can be very specific about it. Uh, I think we can describe its behavioral uh, symptoms very clearly. A certain kind I think of love. And, and, well, we, uh, romance, attachment, companionate love, I think there can be definitions for all of these. Yeah, but Paternal then we have, love. we have parental love and we have exactly. platonic love. We and can we have be very specific about the definitions. Love. And we can be, we can be specific about the, the definitions and I think, and we see it in behavior, we can describe it behaviorally, I think, to each other quite easily and anything that you see in behavior or any difference. So there, may be, there may be many types of love, but if you can describe it behaviorally, you know there's going to be a different brain system there also mediating it. And, and I think one of the things that actually neuroscience can help to do is to help us with these definitions for them, to realize we can come up with definitions for these things. Do well, you, I think we can, we can make correlations between the caudate nucleus lighting up and some kind of grooming, grooming behavior between either two animals or two humans. You can correlate them, but the, you can't say anything about what's causing which, and, and whether you decide to call it love is a matter not, of definition. Not whether you're causing it, but it depends upon where it is now. For example, if I had found that uh, everybody's uh, prefrontal, medial prefrontal cortex was active you know, in this study, I would, have, I would have a very different story to tell you or maybe no story. The fact that it was in this primitive part of the brain uh, gives me more to tell you about it and why it may be so hard to control 
when, when, you're, when you fall in love. And by the way, so romance, romance can indeed bring pain. And it does, and there's nothing like heartbreak. And, and as I, even whole cultures are afraid of love. Uh, but the fact is, for many people, when, when they are in a relationship and, and they were in love and they stay together, and sometimes even in arranged marriages, you, f you do fall in love after, after you get married, that romance period often plays a critical role in keeping the couple together. Uh, they can remember it when things aren't so good, <laughs> you know? I, I think that romance does play a role in attachment later, mm -hmm. too. And so I do think... What if there's never any attachment? Then you does go that, on, then then you go that, on that to somebody else. there's been no love? No, no, no. You can does, certainly feel does the, romance... Does the result and, and or sort of, you know, the, uh, the, uh, you the, can uh, fall the goal out of love, of love have, any, have, have anything to do with, with, with the definition? So, like, if I'm in it for... The we can't hear you. Hello? 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 Yeah, that's better. Yeah, uh, I was just asking uh, Lucy if uh, the result of the relationship has any effect on what sort of love existed. So, if it winds up being a week-long relationship or a 50-year marriage, uh, does that fact then affect what actually happened from a neurological perspective in, uh, um, you know, between, between the people? Or is that, or, or, is, or is the love, at least from your perspective, analyzed as a separate I'm not thing? sure I understand your question. So what, what's the, what is the reason to be in love? Is there, is there a reason for it? <laughs> yes, it's part of the human reproductive strategy. You have mm -hmm. sex. Now wait a minute. Yes, I, yes. I take issue with that. No, no. It's not, it's I'm not reproducing nothing. But <laughs> no, but you have a partner who is making you safer. It's, okay. it's, it's even That's known, it's, it's known even, uh, you know, there have been a lot of studies that suggest that people live longer when they're in partnerships and, and you're safer when you're walking down New York City survival. streets. It's survival, it's yeah, survival. You're I safer when you're walking down the street <laughs> when you're with someone else, you know. So it's, it's not just, it's, it's part of the reproductive strategy and part of the safety strategy. But an important, an important really It makes romance very unromantic. <laughs> it's nothing to do with reproduction. Uh, we, uh, even for fall in people, love, it doesn't. Uh, when you fall in love, you very often, and I'm not talking about our society right now, remember, I'm talking about the evolution, our even human evolution, before there were such constraints, uh, that romance was there. Romance often, uh, one way of looking at it, should I say, here's a working hypothesis, okay? Okay. That, um, You've got sex, which just, uh, you, have to, you have to have the capability, you know? And sex brings pleasure too, besides being reproductive, but we do need to reproduce to survive as a species. Okay, we just that's do. But how much okay, but don't say that's a different issue. But, but like, that is no, a no, issue. oh no, it's not necessarily, because you've got, you've got sex, the but, then, but then you've got romance that keeps you there's keeps a lot of straight focused. people who don't want to reproduce. That's what I'm saying. I just but said they that. do it because it's part of a larger societal. They do it for many reasons. Yeah, they, well, they do it for many. lots of well, reasons aside from some innate too. feeling that they're that yes. they won't be a person. So, okay. I just, so you have you have your okay. individual time out. Time out. Yes. <laughs> I, I knew this was going to happen. No, I just I think I think we should keep I it an open. I think we should be. And I'm not being heterosexist either. I don't mean to sound heterosexist, but I'm just well, saying or whatever the heterophobic. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. There are a lot of there are a lot of assumptions that are being made here by all of us. One is that uh, falling in love is good for our species and it helps with reproduction and survival. That's, That's one no idea. longer true. It's no longer true that that, that uh, we as a species are 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 going to do well by increasing our population at all. Yeah, more more people to Quite the war. opposite. Oh, and then as far as you're talking about reproduction, uh, you know, when you're a teacher, is that what Albie says, the kids will ruin you. I mean, it's the opposite. But of, when you're uh, teaching students, you're doing a form of reproduction there as well. I mean, if you take it in a narrow sense, 
reproduction of, of, of infants, that, that's not the only kind of reproduction that there is. There's reproduction of, of, of students. There's reproduction of students. It just went off. Hello. Hello. I think they all went off. You might want our techies went oh, home. Everyone. Just when it was getting good, Hello? too. I totally agree. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Well, I so like you that should, definition. You shouldn't say you put yourself down by saying I don't, re I don't pre reproduce nothing. But that's just <laughs> not true. Okay. I mean, uh, we all reproduce in different ways, right. and hopefully we reproduce in a positive way. Yeah, no, 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 I'm I, fine. As nurturing, as, nurturing. But you, you know where, where I was going when I, before, too. I'm just saying, I think it's, I think it's a loaded word. And if, if, we def, if we make it more open, that's great. If we all know what the definition is that we're all using, fine. That yes. wasn't the initial well, definition. Well, let us, say that, let us say that specifically just for reproductive purposes, there is no need for love. You can have sex and have kids without having love for the person with whom you had sex. So love in that way, that's so, why I was... We're shut down. So, so, is that that my, shut down. so my point is... It, no, nothing's working. We're, we're all going to have to speak louder. Just, just, just imagine... It's oh, no, here it goes. Here it goes. It's back on again. Are we back? It's yes, like a, we're back. It's like the Super Bowl. It, you know, it's just a yes. slow... <laughs> the lights are off. <laughs> that, that's, why, that's why I think... That, there you go. That's why I think that it becomes a kind of just turning around and around because we don't start with proper definitions of the term and there are so many varieties of it and it's not even clear what we mean when we talk about love that it has the kind of correlation that you talk about. For example, you gave the, uh, that when somebody is in love sees the face of the beloved, the amygdala quietens them. If he sees the face of a familiar person where there is no danger, the amygdala would quieten them. So we oh, need no, to the, be... the experiment was comparing those two. But it does quieten it then. So we need to be more, I think, precise in terms of defining it, especially from the neuroscience point of view, because neuroscience is what's going to enlighten us about some of the biological aspects of this. But of course, the, the, we don't only but, have to deal with neuroscience, right. it's an event that happens in life, and we need to see what is it about. But maybe it's the adjectives that help us. I mean, we are a little bit fixed, right? We have been a little fixed so far in this um, romantic love. And actually, I'd be very interested to know whether anyone in your field is doing the same kind of work on parents looking at mm -hmm. children. Yes. Um, and, what, and, you know, that's also survival. That's also building attachment and so on. Um, and uh, what, uh, what would differentiate, uh, neurologically, what would differentiate that from a romantic impulse? Uh, there Quite specifically, especially, it's interesting that um, oxytocin, for example, mm. um, which is all so-called milk letdown factor, you know, it's, it's very important at childbirth. Um, uh, oxytocin appears to play a big role in the brain to mediate these attachment feelings and behaviors that we engage in as, as parents, uh, and also later in the relationship. With, Mm -hmm. A partner, I'll call it. Uh, yes, the, it's people are investigating this, and it's different from romance. It's, it's using different brain systems and and mainly different um, neurotransmitters or chemicals or hormones too. You have different different things involved. So, and uh, to go along with that, when you were uh, speaking about your, um, the group in China, and going back four years later and seeing how they had progressed, let's say. Um, so then, by then, that extreme romantic love was probably pretty much played out for most of them. So then either they had split off from each other or they had built some other kind of attachment. So. What did that look like? I'm not so, so much talking about the splitting off. Those people probably were ready for new romantic love, but the people who were attached but not so energized anymore. So that too, uh, the attachment seems to be, it's, it's a little 
more complicated in the brain. It's, it's higher up in the brain. It's not so much this reflex level. It's, uh, but it's still part of the reward system, by the way. But it's part of the reward system that's getting much more information from cognitive areas, mm -hmm. these frontal areas of the brain. The attachment so system is much more dependent upon uh, probably your, your experiences with that person, uh, your not just memories about perhaps primary caregivers, but memories about with that person, what you've done, um, your, your evaluation of them. You're constantly, it turns out, we're constantly making evaluations about the situations we're in and the people who we're looking at and, and uh, what we might get from it, actually. Uh, but the, this, yeah, this whole idea that is that attachment is quite different, more cognitively based, certainly more complex, yeah. So does this satisfy you if you put different adjectives in yeah. front of the word love, well, then you have, then you have it depends <laughs> romantic at what, no, It depends at what level of discourse you are talking about. If you are talking about poetry and you want to use love to communicate something that appeals to you, feels that you're expressing something and communicate it that appeals to the other, then it doesn't matter exactly what the definition of love is. Mm -hmm. When you move gradually towards psychoanalysis for that matter and towards neuroscience where you're talking about the workings of the mind and the brain, then the ways you distinguish them and you define them become very, very important. Mm -hmm. For example, is maternal love the, ne the same as romantic love? Uh, We've so, heard that it's not right. really. So <laughs> it becomes increasingly more important depending on where you are. So that's all I'm trying to yeah. say, that we need to be and mindful we don't need of a that. Single and no matter definition. which way we look at it, it's multifactorial. Hmm. So uh, we, we can, anyone can study a level and, and get clarity with it, but you can only measure one, one level at a time. And then you know, there are other levels that you can't study at the same time that you're studying one level. So uh, I, I would bring in here from a scientific point of view that we, we live in a world of scientific uncertainty. We, we cannot know the truth about everything through science. And I, I doubt that when uh, Obama's plan for 10 years of mapping the brain, that we're gonna know very much more than we know than, than uh, Shakespeare or some poet can tell us about love. So let me tell you, I, I have a colleague um, named Semir Zeki who was one of the other very first people to study romantic love and the brain systems of romantic love. And as he says, you know, it's, it's poetry and literature and from the past that really help neuroscience, inform neuroscience about love and kind of, and, and how to interpret what we see. Uh, remember, a, a neuroscientist uh, really thinks that all of our behavior is based in a, a brain system, right? And that it's all of behavior is physiological at some level, all right? So, Literature is just a, and poetry is really, is, is just a reflection of what's going on in our brains. But I, I have to, because poetry has been mentioned like 20 times in the last 10 minutes. I just have to ask, mm -hmm. if that's true, yes. what everybody's saying about poetry, why do so few people read it? Oh. <laughs> it's an interesting question, except the people who write it, generally. That's only a very recent well, development. Because By people, way, I think, have read true. poetry at true. home in, but, in the but, Renaissance. Definitely. And all the way through to yeah. Virginia Woolf's family, where they all read poetry right. sitting around at home at night. I think it, right. and in, in, I happen to be married to someone who's Russian, and they read poetry to each other when he was growing up. So, you know, well yeah. into the 1970s. And it's definitely an American. So. But what, what would you say about all the popular songs that all the kids are listening I to? I think they're all about the fact that if you don't have a partner, you're nothing. Mm -hmm. No, That's but what I think it is it, I mean, the Supremes say, you know, whenever you're near me, I hear a symphony. Is that, 
poetry to you? No, it's a song lyric. And it's not a bad song lyric. It's a pretty good song lyric. <laughs> but is it anywhere close poetry. to poetry? I think, no. I think why, more people why is, are... Why is, a song, why is a song not a poem? Because it's a song. But a poem uh, is a song as well. I, just, I could sing your poem and have a, have a guitar or whatever. It would be a song. If it, if I could, I could if it sing rhyme. this. No, everyone would leave, but I mean, <laughs> I could sing this. <laughs> and it's, you know, I mean, I don't know if there is that, but, you know, it's rhyming, it's very short phrases, pithy Yeah, sentences. but I think song lyrics get, I think song it's lyrics like are in a hurry. Because it's so compressed. Yeah, it's just, I think it's more, more of a hurry than even a poem is. And they generally, I mean, forgive me for saying this, but most of There's Taylor less symbolism. You're, you're right. I mean, well, it's, it's not the same, but it's... really wrote lyrics of not no longer with us. There aren't a lot of great lyricists in the world. I mean, let's face it. Right, it is, it is, it is different, but there may be some... I'm just trying to think. I'm not sure we're not there aren't as many people maybe reading poetry now, but I think there's some poetry in people's lives in, in music lyrics, for example. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not saying that. I mean, God forbid that the lives are empty. <laughs> but I also think it's an American phenomenon. And if you go to other countries in the world, you will find that poetry is very valuable. People will stand online in a book, from out of a bookstore in Russia when a new book of poems comes out. They need it as they need bread, but not in this country. And the reason not in this country is because people don't want to deal with their feelings most of the time. People don't want to deal and with And poetry is about feel with their feelings. They don't want to face what they're feeling. That's why look at it, that's technology. Well, well they have to see Fred. Then they, they have to go to Fred. Yeah, I think they don't <laughs> get I it. Think uh, people just understand poetry. I mean, since there's been a piece. I don't understand because they don't read it. <laughs> We've got since all you have to do is read it, and you understand it. Well, I think we're off topic. I don't understand no, no, astrophysics. There's been a plea, a plea here to go to Fred. You know, like go to Dr. Ruth. It's a plea to go to Fred. Well, first of all, I want to say about the audience that you've been. I'd like to say about the audience that the audience has been extraordinarily patient and, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully absorbed in the, the, uh, the, the noise that's been going on here at the round table. But we, we do like to hear from the audience, and so I thought maybe we'd have a few questions for 15 minutes or so, and then maybe we could have a chance to respond. And, uh, you have to go to the mic when you have questions. Hi. Um, I was very taken, Dr. Uh, Brown, with your uh, description of love. And to me, um, it sounds like a very addictive thing. Oh. And so I was wondering if you could talk about that and whether any research is being done between romantic love and addiction, because it sounds like it hits the same brain areas that addictive substances hit. So indeed, thank you for she, bringing she, that she, up. It's a plant. She, a plant. <laughs> <laughs> you were She's a plant. A plant. You're a plant. <laughs> Because when we first started doing these studies, I actually, that was one of the things I was interested in, because I thought there, there were commonalities, and I, um, and I predicted brain areas would be involved that were, we knew were involved in addiction. So, of course, because of the clinical relevance, the uh, drug addiction studies were done first. But uh, it wasn't quite the same, but it was very similar. So this ventral tegmental area that I've told you about that's so critical to romance and is really the drive and reward system is also active when um, cocaine abusers are given cocaine and they feel high. Now, when you're heartbroken, think about it, you're even, when you're heartbroken, you can be even more obsessed about the person and even more, in a way, addicted to the person and you must be near them and you're constantly seeking them. And that's, it was under the condition of heartbreak that we saw the, the, the drug addiction systems really become involved. So what, actually, I was um, asked to go and speak at the National Institute for Drug Abuse. At what One of the things we really came up with as we were a kind of round table like this was that uh, the systems for romance may be the natural, it's the natural system that the drugs hop onto you know, and, and activate really strongly. But the reason we're, uh, we get addicted to drugs at all is because we have these natural systems for addiction. That's the system that's being used when you, when you abuse drugs. Uh, 
it, we need that system there. We need to be addicted to some things. We need to be addicted to other people for protection. Um, we, we need these, these attachments. They're, 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 so they're is necessary. it Casanova syndrome a true addiction? Ah, oh, so, and so you mean by Casanova? Like Don Juan or yeah. Uh, Pardon? Yes, uh, Cas you know, Don Juan Casanova syndrome is is a, is a true, so, is that a true addiction then? The Casanova syndrome where you have, where the person goes from one person to another, to another, to another, the Clinton, always the falling Clinton in syndrome. love, always falling in love. Spitzer, Spitzer, And then Clinton, immediately Letterman. moving on. Yeah, well, I, well, in a way, yes, they're, it's a little like cocaine. They're constantly getting the dopamine rush. And that right. but, uh, but that's different, in a way, I think, from that other question that she There's You can be addicted to love, so you want to constantly go back and get, you know, fall in love again. But what I'm saying is that the, that, that system for most of us is, is there for a very good reason. Um, and the natural system is we are naturally addicted to each other which is, is nice, and so we keep seeking, we keep, we keep going on these dates and keep going online to, to try to find someone, and eventually I think people do. Um, heartbreak oh is for, there for sure, but that addiction Well, there's a lot of merry-go-round, too, in online dating. I mean, you meet a lot of people who they found a good person, they can't seem to make it work, and uh, one of the reasons I think it's, is it's become easier to not make it work. Right, and you know what? Because of this new expanded pool and all the technology we have to meet. And I think it's more and more important and to, for people to understand to who, community. that it's so much who you are. If you're the kind of person who can suppress negative judgment and put the other person first, you're much more likely to have, make a relationship work. We're going to have to try to yeah. keep these questions mm -hmm. shorter and, and the answers shorter. If possible. Yes. Uh, Claire Steinberger, I'm a psychoanalyst and a family and couple therapist. So I'm just wondering if other people in the room, and I know Fred's work very well and really respected and used in my teaching for uh, many years. And what I'm thinking of is you have more in common than, uh, than is uh, led to believe. Uh, one of the thoughts I have is it was a biological model is very Freudian, and, and, and you do bring in the unconscious, uh, libido, love, and then there's um, uh, Fairburn, the social drive, and I and here and um, and I Fred brings in developmental, and it works together. Now, when you're talking about the capacity to fall in love is one thing, and the capacity to stay in love and maintain love is something else, and that's a very important paper also by Otto Kernberg who does the range, and, and Fred is sort of alluding to that, and it's really important. Now, when you have attachment, and it is disruptive and insecure, and all the stuff that we're all aware of with Dan Stern and Beatrice Beebe, and a lot of work that's being done, what you do find is that the infant who has, is wired up, and this is the research, wired up, so that the attachment is, is loaded, if you will, with strife or, or whatever, and comes out developmentally, and affect and cognition as you get older, and repetition. And so we can really hear, if you want to pull it together in, in, in some way, that it can be a tension between these two spheres, but you can bring it together. So when you're wired up, it makes it hard later to let yourself have all that you could have if things had been different. And I think biologically we are wired or set up to connect, whether it's in the social fabric kind of way, or it's in the, if you will, sexual area, libidinal, and the species uh, going on, it all works together. And I think it, this is room then for an integration uh, from what we're listening to. Thank you. Next question. This lady here is in line. Very short. Uh, I have a very short comment and uh, I have a very short comment in uh, uh, in defense of sciences. I myself as a researcher in music cognition and professional pianist. Uh, there is a beautiful line by Pushkin about music that um, among the pleasures of life, music differs only to love. 
and music is a melody, uh, but love itself is a melody. Uh, they are dealing with two very different fields. Uh, while art and music gives us knowledge in highly uh, condensed form, sciences move by very short, but very small steps toward toward knowledge and learning about very intimate things. It's learning about ourselves. It's a, it's a difficult pursuit, and in order to understand the complexity, we really have to be very intuitive. So I don't see any conflict in studying very complex things in sciences. Uh, it's just because this sphere of love and sphere of music, they both suffer from this attitude that we cannot explain everything about love, everything about music, but it's not what we expect from sciences today. We expect learning by small steps about who we are. Thank you. Thank you. Could I, could I, that was, yes, that was very ahead. lovely, but if I could also say something about um, music and actually one of the things that um, we haven't really gone into but which would have been, which would be a very interesting further discussion here is how the senses really play into the initiation of love. And in the Renaissance, it was strongly believed that there were two senses that led most directly to the sensation of love, vision and hearing through music, that music was the accompaniment of love. And this is why you have so many pictures in which there is a lute player playing to Venus and, and so on, that those two senses were the things that were most closely connected to the feelings of love. Mm -hmm. This lady and then this gentleman, she was waiting. I think this has been a wonderful discussion that could go on for hours and hours and hours. Having spent 43 years as a relationship and couple sex therapist, I really, and I'm sure you know as well as I do, that the brain changes with trauma. And that's what the speaker before said. And that what most people have some form of trauma, which to me makes me wonder why they didn't want marriage and the thing, because there's so much trauma and fear of attachment out here, especially in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> and you talked about love being fear, and you answered it so beautifully by saying, if you grow up and attach with fear, your love is going to be fear. The reason I'm standing here to say something is I'm starting with the 20 year olds in our society that I think we need to know more how we were imprinted as children. When I was at the World Economic Forum and ran workshops, everybody had to answer the question, what did I learn? about relationships by watching my parents. And that somehow is the answer to how do I attach, which I think is the same as love. I, I have a, a couple where he is an antique dealer and his wife says he loves his antiques much more than he loves her. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> I think this is an important discussion, but I think we all, I should be able to ask which one of you, everyone in the room here, how were you imprinted with love? Do you reach for somebody that you can never have? And then when they actually turn around, you drop them because the intimacy becomes too much? 
Are you somebody who likes to be invaded and abused? Are you somebody who abused somebody? That is the love imprint that we all have, and we should know about and be more conscious of. Thank you. <laughs> Next. You know, I just want to say that I think one thing that's very important is we all, f for self-knowledge, is that we all have different attachment styles, really, too, and and different and personalities that that are biologically based, also even even kind of genetically. And I think for especially for the younger generation coming up and dealing with these kinds of dating situations, I think self-knowledge becomes even more important and knowing your attachment style, whether you're an avoidant or, or an anxious but attacher. I, do, I mean, I think I do agree that a lot of the answer to that isn't exactly what you said, which is to look backward at the experience and, and maybe, uh, you know, the biology may have less to do with it than we think. Okay. Probably not surprising that uh, in this crowd, uh, I'm another psychoanalyst and couples <laughs> therapist. Uh, more years than I, I care to count. Um, I, I agree that we need definitions. I hope what I'm saying is in no way against defining, but I think that it's a problem if when we ask what is love, that we treat that as a noun and look for some kind mm -hmm. of separate definition with a frame or an edge around it. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that love is a process, That's and it keeps same. changing, even between the same two people. And it's a developmental process, what's more. And it goes through a lot of stages that may begin with infatuation or some kind of erotic chemical response, may begin with an awful lot of projection I think that's always there. And then may head into uh, romantic emotional union. And people might live together, try to make an everyday life together through that. And then there's a developmental stage that I think is as important as any other. And I would call it disappointment. <laughs> because there's a fall into disappointment with a couple, just as there is a falling into love. And when you get to disappointment, that's a very, very important kind of choice point. Because how people treat their disappointment is gonna tell everything about whether they might grow together into a more mature kind of loving or wind up parting into self-preservation and a change from abundance into scarcity and a sort of Darwinian struggle for control of the relationship and whose needs get met. So, and it goes from there. So I think, and then as Walter Benjamin once said, the important thing is not love at first sight, it's love at last sight. <laughs> and that's that stage of growing old together and facing each other's mortality. Uh, so it's a long developmental process and I think we have to be very careful not to be reductionist and say love is a this or a that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's true. Hi, my name is Maxine Zaifman, and I was married to a member of this society, Israel Zaifman, who died 27 years ago, and I'm also a psychoanalyst uh, at the uh, New York Freudian that's become contemporary psychoanalytic. I, I wanted to say very much what the last person had said, because I was lucky enough to find a soulmate, and no one has talked about a soulmate or kindred spirit. Uh, and I, I found him because when I was 15 years old, because um, he was in total contrast to my parents' marriage. My parents was, had a very uh, conflicted, angry, my mother hated the marriage, was very depressed, constantly was running away. Uh, and uh, I found someone who had strength of character, um, who was 
totally capable of being there. And I knew this exactly when I was 15 years old, because when I was five years old, I very clearly understood what a terrible marriage was and why they, what they couldn't resolve seemed to be so simple and they were unable to resolve the conflicts. So I found, I found someone who was that soulmate uh, and it is really to have that kind of lasting, um, lasting love there. I used to get five calls a day saying, I love you, Mackie, uh, which is pretty lovely, you know. So you can have that kind of luck. I think it is luck also to find someone, you know, who has those kinds of characteristics. I mean, and uh, able to be there in a total way, trustworthy, witty, uh, um, you know, caring about society, other-oriented, all those kinds of good qualities. So in some ways, it is, it is a matter of luck. <laughs> I've never okay. found anyone else. <laughs> Keep looking. There's no other questions. Yeah. Are there any more questions before we close? It was hard after the last testimony to. Okay, uh, I'm not doing a to testimony. Know what to, where to go? <laughs> but I'm a psychiatrist too, of course, and I have a lot of patients who have erotomania, which we didn't touch upon today. But erotomania is when a patient falls in love with someone, usually of a higher social status, and they follow them around, stalking behavior. So, Dr. Brown, you should study these people because they're full of, I think, dopamine and different kinds of chemicals. And exactly. It's these systems uh, on, you know, overdrive. it's overdrive. Overdrive, exactly. Overdrive. So right. they might be good for your studies. So right. I just thought I'd add that. <laughs> this lady, let's show if you can go on Yeah. The topic was love, the interrogation of love. Am I correct? Was that the topic? Yes. Well, I started to think about it. You mentioned music. What is this thing called love? You mentioned all the other emotions, whether it's kindness, whether it's horny, whether it's whatever. We have, I'm in the mood for love. What does that mean? We have the Liebestod. You know what that does. So we're always thinking about love. It's a force. It's an energy. It's something that's invisible. And you never know when it's going to happen. I do believe luck it plays a part. But <clears throat> I think we need to think about where we are today in this culture. Unrealistic expectations because the media is killing us with all this crotch stuff and everything else. <laughs> I beg to do it with my friend over here who thinks that only in Europe or in Russia or in France do they understand anything about love and read. In my profession, I get calls all the time saying, don't tell me about this utopian. I don't want to hear about series. Just give me a great love story. When you get back to me with a great love story, we'll talk. Everybody's still looking for a great love story. We don't have a Shakespeare right now. We don't well, have he that. He didn't have any good love stories. No, I'm not talking about sonnets. I'm talking about yeah. wonderful expressions of love. It was not a ha the happy poets marriage. today, the poets today are reflecting our society. We have a society that is not dealing with love. It's dealing with terror. It's dealing with sexual annihilation of women. We're dealing with trafficking. We're not talking about the beauty of the, uh, and the museums of Ruben's women and gorgeous men and the Adonis and David. We're talking about slaying, killing. So it's very hard to take this beautiful force that's still around us and grab it and see each other and look at each other. I would like somebody to talk about the force of love. Will you be the example? Will you be the example? No, I know. Just we the have energy, to be the example. The energy of it. It's, it's universal. People read about it, but we have illiterate people. What are we going to do about that? Well, we, have a, we still have 
we, we should look back to uh, Cupid, because although we have made Cupid a sort of silly figure, right. Cupid, of course, in mythology is an unbelievably powerful figure who shoots his arrows. You don't know where they're going to go. You don't know who they're going to hit. Once he hit his own mother, Venus, and she fell in love with the mortal Adonis, whom she could not save, that that force, um, which until recently was seen indeed as something so overwhelming that could strike at any time at, to any person in a, in a way that could not be controlled, you know, is, is something that we should all be thinking about, the power of it, the way that it can turn our lives upside down, the way that it can uh, turn for good or, or, or for bad. I mean, it, it, it is there, um, and we need to maybe help our children both get the very positive aspects of that and also um, realize did, the importance of it. That. Realize the importance of it. To you about the imprinting of a child early yeah. on, I think that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. See. Well, that, that's, uh, I, I think, as somebody said, we could go on for a few more hours. But uh, oh that goes on. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.